Hi everyone, I'm Julie Sloan from the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. Thank you for taking the time to attend the webinar um, regarding Medicaid and the jail population this afternoon. Everyone should be able to see a PowerPoint presentation entitled Medicaid Initiatives to Support Justice-Involved Individuals. Um, if you're not seeing that screen, please let us know. Um, I have Sapphire Ogumu and Sean Latz here from the Ohio Department of Medicaid. Um, Sapphire will be doing the training today. Um, we've reserved plenty of time for questions and answers following Sapphire's presentation. Um, so please mute your phones while she presents and you may type any questions as they come up into the question box throughout the webinar. Another, after the presentation, I will read the questions and Sapphire will answer them. If there are any questions that, are, you are, that we are in, unable to answer, we will write them down and post answers on the Stepping Up webpage. Um, a recording of the webinar, as well as the PowerPoint presentation, will be posted on the um, Stepping Up webpage um, that can be accessed at mha.ohio.gov slash stepping up. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and um, hand it off to Sapphire and let her um, start the presentation. Um, please don't forget to mute your phones and type questions in the question box on your screen. Okay. Thank you, Julie. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're very excited to be here with you today to discuss the Medicaid initiatives that we have for justice-involved individuals. We had a recent policy change that took effect on 8-1 of 2016. This change in policy, this change in policy allowed for incarcerated individuals to be eligible for payment of certain claims. The rule states that an individual is not considered an inmate of a public institution while he or she is admitted as an inpatient in a hospital, nursing facility, juvenile psychiatric facility, or ICF-IID. The Ohio Department of Medicaid currently has three initiatives for incarcerated individuals. We have our DRC inpatient hospitalization, DYS presumptive eligibility, and our DRC pre-release project. These initiatives are a collaboration between ODM and the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Correction, so we work with state prisons. But we will take some time to discuss each of these initiatives, as some of our processes may be beneficial for use at the county level. First, we'll discuss the inpatient hospitalization initiative. The purpose of this initiative is to have inpatient and associated professional services covered by Medicaid for incarcerated individuals who are admitted to the hospital for 24 hours or more. Our goal is to shift the cost of inpatient and associated professional services from DRC, which is all state dollars, to Medicaid, which is a combination of state and federal funds. So Medicaid has agreed to cover the cost of the inpatient stay as well as the associated professional services. So what are associated professional services? They are services that are rendered during the inpatient stay. So for example, we have John who's incarcerated at Noble Correctional Institution. He's injured and must be taken to OSU Hospital. He's admitted for 24 hours. While he's hospitalized, John has to have blood tests, images taken, and is seen also by a wound care specialist. These are all professional services that are related to John's inpatient stay. So these services would be covered by Medicaid. So once John is discharged from the hospital and is now back at the DRC facility, um, it's a couple weeks later and he has to continue to see that wound care specialist and have additional imaging done. Those services would not be considered associate, associated professional services and therefore Medicaid would not cover those. So the process that we have for enrolling individuals into Medicaid through our inpatient project it does um, require good communication between DRC and ODM. Um, DRC sends our unit, our direct enrollment unit, applications for individuals who are admitted to the hospital for at least 24 hours. Then the direct enrollment unit is responsible for processing the application. The case is housed in a special ODM caseload and Medicaid will remain open for that individual for a year, just in the event that there's another inpatient hospital stay that occurs. Then after 12 months, we would complete a pre-termination review. If DRC requests another year of Medicaid for that individual, we would complete a renewal. But if they do not, Medicaid coverage will end. If Medicaid coverage ends for that individual and later on down the road, 
the individual has another inpatient hospital stay, DRC can just reapply and eligibility will be made. The other initiative that we have is with the Department of Youth Services. The purpose of this initiative is to provide youth who are in DYS custody Medicaid coverage upon release. This will allow youth the immediate access to medical treatment upon release and will provide a continuum of health care. With this initiative, we actually started at the same time as our DRC pre-release one. We wanted the projects to mirror each other, but since we were dealing with children, we realized we'd encounter too many obstacles if we tried to enroll them the exact same way that we enroll our DRC pre-release individuals. For example, we knew that most of these children would be released back to their parents or guardians who may have income or may not even want their child on Medicaid. So we had to come up with a more creative way of reaching our goal. As you can see from this slide, we refer to this project as DYS presumptive eligibility. So I'm going to take a few minutes to discuss what presumptive eligibility is. So presumptive eligibility, or PE, is time-limited medical assistance. The eligibility determination for PE is made based on the individual's self-attestation. So although it is a simplified determination, there are some guidelines that have to be met in order for the individual to be eligible. Um, as you can see from the slide, the individual must not have had PE in the last 12 months. The individual must also be an Ohio resident, a U.S. citizen, or qualified non-citizen, and must also meet the non-financial criteria for a Medicaid category. The last bullet does give a list of the Medicaid groups that can get PE coverage, and as you can see, children are on that list. So what does PE cover? PE covers everything. So although it's time limited, it is still full Medicaid coverage. I do want to mention the only exception to this is for pregnant women. PE for them is limited to ambulatory prenatal care. The slide also talks about the time limits for presumptive eligibility. Um, PE would begin on the date that the individual is determined to be presumptively eligible. And it ends either the date that the CDJFS, the County Department of Job and Family Services, makes an eligibility determination for ongoing medical assistance or the last day of the month following the month in which PE was determined. So for example, if an individual is determined eligible for PE, on 11-5 of 2016, and no application for ongoing medical assistance was submitted, his PE would end on 12-31 of 2016. So once PE is approved, the qualified entity, or QE, will supply medication for the individual. And the next slide will discuss what a QE is. Um, but that QE gives that medication to that individual in order for them to be able to have immediate access to their care. Also, an individual that's on PE would not be enrolled in a managed care plan. Um, this is because that Medicaid coverage is time limited, but once the full application is sent to the County Department of Job and Family Services and the CDJFS determines that that individual is eligible for ongoing Medicaid, then they will enroll that individual into a managed care plan. QEs are also required to take all reasonable steps to help the individual complete an application for ongoing medical assistance, or at least to make contact with the CDJFS. Once the CDJFS processes that full Medicaid application for the individual, they're going to, they may need extra verifications. Um, they're going to try to verify everything electronically, but if they're not able to, they're going to contact that individual to get additional verifications. So I did mention QEs quite a bit on the previous slide, so here is the definition of qualified entity. A qualified entity means the source of eligibility determination for presumptive eligibility. They are limited to the following. We have our county, Department of Job and Family Services agencies, hospitals, DYS, federal quali federally qualified health care centers, or FQHCs, and our FQHC lookalikes. So in order to provide medical coverage to youth who are being released from DYS custody, as a QE, D DYS explores presumptive eligibility for these children. We're going to go through the process of how they explore presumptive eligibility on the next slide. But I did want to mention that second bullet. 
Um, there are some youth in DYS custody that may need inpatient hospital services. So if a child is admitted to the hospital for 24 hours or more, DYS will send an application to our direct enrollment unit and the application will be processed. Okay, now let's talk about the process involved in getting children approved for presumptive eligibility upon release. DYS identifies children who are within a week of release from their custody. They log into the presumptive eligibility portal, and that's the system that's used to determine presumptive eligibility, and they approve that PE for that child. Once the child's approved, a letter is printed right there, and it's given to the child's parole officer. Then the child's parole officer will assist the family in completing a full Medicaid application for ongoing benefits. Our last initiative is the DRC pre-release project. Like DYS presumptive eligibility, the purpose of this initiative is to allow incarcerated individuals to have Medicaid upon release. However, unlike DYS presumptive eligibility, with pre-release, we're able to bypass that time-limited PE approval and skip right to the full Medicaid application. By doing this, these individuals not only receive Medicaid upon release, but they also are enrolled into a managed care plan. Our goals for this initiative are to provide immediate access to medical treatment upon release. And what's great about this is that these individuals are able to walk out of the DRC facility with a copy of their Medicaid card in hand with their release packet. So if they needed to go straight to the doctor or to the pharmacy, they'd be able to do that as soon as they step foot out of the DRC facility. This initiative also allows for a continuum of health care so there's no gap in coverage from the time that the individual leaves the DRC facility to the time when they enter back into the community. And it's also our hope that this will reduce the likelihood of the individual reoffending and ending up back in DRC custody. So here's our process for enrolling individuals through our pre-release project. So we have an interface between DRC and our eligibility system, Ohio Benefits. So DRC sends a file with all of the individual's demographic information on the 15th of every month for all individuals that are being released within about 105 days. Some of the applications are processed through the automated system, um, which means that the system can electronically verify all the needed information, create a case, and approve Medicaid. Um, but, and the worker does not have to touch the case at all. However, if the cases are not able to be processed through that no-touch process or that automated system, then work, a worker has to actually manually process that case. And that's what our direct enrollment unit does. We also use the DRC main address of 770 West Broad Street for mailing purposes so that the individual can receive a copy of their Medicaid card in their release packet when they walk out of the facility. Um, while the individual is still in DRC custody, the case remains in a special ODM case bank until release. And then at the end of the month, um, prior to the release date, we update the individual's address. So we change that mailing address from DRC headquarters to the physical address where the individual intends to reside upon release. And then we transfer the case to the individual's county of residence. So this is a flow chart that we provided to the County Department of Job and Family Services to guide them on how to handle a case if an individual becomes incarcerated. Um, counties are notified of incarceration because there's an interface between DRC and Ohio Benefits, and that sends an alert to the caseworker. Um, so the county would know um, if they have an individual in their caseload that has become incarcerated. So it kind of gives them a guide on what they need to do with that. So if the, if the county receives alert, an alert that an individual is incarcerated, they're supposed to change the living arrangement code to incarceration. They also want to consider TANF and SNAP as well. Um, they also have to find out what the household status is for that individual. So if the individual is single, then they can just transfer that case to our ODM case bank because we house all cases for individuals who are incarcerated in a state facility. However, if an individual is part of a household, 
then they have to change that individual's living arrangement code to incarcerated, make them permanently out of the home, and then re-explore eligibility for the entire household. Now, if these individuals end up needing services once they're in DRC custody, say they have an incident and they have to be in the hospital for 24 hours or more, then DRC would send us an application so that we could explore inpatient hospital services for them. This is another flowchart that we provided to the County Department of Job and Family Services to guide them on how to handle a case if an individual is being released. So we'll go through the flowchart um, so that you kind of have an understanding of what the county is doing for, for these individuals. So the county receives notification from DRC through that interface. The county performs upfront inquiry of the case to see what's going on with it. Um, and they'll make appropriate changes to TANF and SNAP if needed. Then they have to find out, is the individual on Medicaid? If the individual is not on Medicaid, they need to find out, was the individual suspended because of Rompier, that reinstatement of Medicaid for public institution recipients? If yes, and they were incarcerated for less than one year, then they could reinstate that individual's Medicaid with no application. If they find that the individual had, was suspended through Romper, but they were incarcerated for more than a year, then they know that they would need to get a new application for that individual. Back on that chart, if they find out that the individual was not suspended through Romper, does not have Medicaid, then of course you'd need an application to explore Medicaid for the individual. Now if the individual is on Medicaid, then the county needs to find out where is that case located. Are they in a county caseload or are they in an ODM caseload? If they find that the individual is in a county caseload, then all they need to do is change the living arrangement code, run the case, and continue Medicaid for that individual. Now changing the living arrangement code from incarcerated to independent will allow that individual to have a full benefit plan for Medicaid. If they find that the individual is in our ODM caseload, then they have to email our direct enrollment mailbox, which is the um, email address that's provided there in that box, OMA enrollment at medicaid.ohio.gov. And then here, we at ODM will make changes to the living arrangement code, make them independent, update their address to the current address that they're residing in, and we will transfer the case to the appropriate county. And as always, we let the counties know that they can feel free to email our direct enrollment mailbox if they have specific questions about cases or any um, DRC individuals. If they're running into any issues, they can feel free to email us and we will assist them. Okay, so now we'll discuss a little bit about county jails. Um, there's no longer any limitation in enrolling in individuals who are incarcerated into Medicaid. So jails can now work with their County Department of Job and Family Services to determine a process to submit applications for Medicaid. Uh, Medicaid applications for offenders can be processed either to pay for inpatient claims or to coordinate care upon the individual's release. Um, ODM, our direct enrollment unit, we are not managing any county jail caseload. Um, we are just managing the state caseload. So it's very important that you communicate with your local county department of job and family services to ensure proper enrollment and case management. Um, I also wanted to mention that we've already discussed this with all 88 job and family services offices through a video conference that we had last month. So they're aware of the need to form that close relationship with their local jails and sheriff's office in order to successfully implement the enrollment. So what is the difference between limited coverage versus full coverage? So if you have an individual that's not being released, still in jail, but an application is submitted for that 24-hour inpatient hospital stay, the Medicaid coverage would be limited. It's only going to allow for inpatient hospital services only. However, on the other hand, if you have an individual that's getting released and an application is submitted so that, that you can facilitate care upon their release, then that Medicaid coverage would, have, would not be limited. They would be eligible for full Medicaid coverage.
So we're going to go through a couple of scenarios that we went through with the counties. Um, this kind of gave them a guide of how to handle cases. Um, we couldn't get specific with every case because each case is different, but we were able to give them a, a few scenarios to help guide them. So in our first scenario, we have Tony, who has been sentenced to 30 days in the county jail. We, the County Department of Job and Family Services, in order to properly update his case, they need to do nothing. They should leave his case as it is. Um, this is because by the time the limited benefit plan would take effect for Tony, he would have already been released. It's such a short-term stay that um, it would actually be a disservice to him by the time he got out and he would have that limited benefit plan instead of the full Medicaid plan that he would need. In our second example, we have Betty. She received a five-month sentence to be served at the local jail. Her case should be updated by changing the living arrangement code to incarcerated rerunning the case to give her that limited benefit plan. And then, of course, that case would still be housed with the county. Um, as I mentioned, we didn't give the county a definition of long-term or short-term short for the length of jail sentences, since each situation is different. So we've advised them to assess the situation and communicate with the jail so that they can determine what's best for the individual and what's best for the county. In our third scenario, we have Mac, who is being released on November 16th. I do want to mention the date would be November 10th, the date that he is um, submitting in the application um, and being released on the 16th. So date he submitted the application is the 10th. He's being released on the 16th. He submitted an application. So the county would want to process the application as usual. They would want to give Mac an independent living arrangement run his case and give him that full benefit plan. Um, even though he submitted the application a few days before he was getting released, we're trying to facilitate care upon release. So in order for that to happen, the county would need to go ahead and process his case and keep his living arrangement code as independent so that he could get that full coverage. In our, first, in our fourth example, example, we have Tori. Tori submitted an application on November 1st but she's not scheduled to be released from the county jail until April of 2017. In this case, the county should process the application based on Tori's current situation. Her living arrangement should be incarcerated so that she can have that limited benefit plan, and then the county, of course, would keep the case in their case bank. I do want to note that the jail would want to communicate with the County Department of Job and Family Services just to inform them of Tori's release date to ensure that the month that she is released, her living arrangement can be changed back to independent so that she can receive full Medicaid coverage upon release. Now, in the event that Tori does not get released and she has to be transferred to a DRC facility, the county would then transfer Tori's case to the ODM case bank and we would manage it there until she was released. So we did hear some really great things about Pickaway County Job and Family Services and how they successfully worked with their county jails to enroll individuals into Medicaid. So we did think it would be helpful to get their perspective on how their process is working so far. Um, I spoke with the, we spoke with the program manager of Pickaway County and he stated that um, we have seen a decrease with inmates returning due to drug usage. The individuals can get treatment once released from jail, so that's a really nice expression there. Pickaway County also provided some insight into their processes and gave some advice to other counties trying to implement the enrollment of jailed individuals. So we asked them a few questions. We asked them, what are your processes for communicating with county jails? They replied, we set up a meeting with the sheriff's office, made a plan to make sure the inmates would be eligible for Medicaid upon release. We also asked them, what are your best practices? They stated, the sheriff's office sends me a roster once a week with the inmates that will be eligible for release. I travel to the sheriff's office, have them complete a paper application. Once the application is completed, I come back to the agency and complete the process. Once I get them approved, I then email the contact worker 
at the sheriff's office with the billing number for the individual. We also asked if there were any issues that they've encountered and how they've overcome them. They stated, I have not encountered any issues so far. We began this process at the beginning of this year. Seems to be going smoothly. Then the last question that we asked, do you have any tips for other counties and jails trying to implement this new process? They stated, the biggest tip I would say, communication between job, job and family service and your local sheriff's office. So we do thank Pickaway County Job and Family Services for providing some insight into their processes. And I'm sure that this will be helpful to other counties that are trying to implement a process to enroll jailed individuals into Medicaid. So I, that is the end of our presentation. And I believe we'll go through any questions that we receive. Um, yes, yeah, so just give me a few minutes to get set up for questions. Um, go ahead and continue to send your questions in. As we go through the questions, um, we'll, we'll hit yours at the end. So I'm doing them in order of um, when they were submitted. Um, additionally, we're gonna, I'm going to turn the audio on so that um, if there's something you need to say or to clarify about your question um, as it's being answered, um, go ahead and unmute your phone. But otherwise, please continue to submit questions by typing in the back. question I have is, um, will we get a copy of the webinar presentation? Um, so that's a question for me. I'm going to, um, we're recording the presentation currently, so I'm going to post the recorded presentation on our Stepping Up website, um, which is at maj.ohio.gov slash stepping up. Um, and I will also post a copy of the PowerPoint presentation on there as well. Um, currently on your screen, you should be able to access a copy of the um, PowerPoint. There's a button that says handouts um, and you should be able to click on the PowerPoint from there um, and print your handouts right now if you want. Otherwise they will be posted on the web page. Um, the next question is how many people do you anticipate enrolling in Medicaid? I don't know. Hi, this is Sean Lotz with the Department of Medicaid. So I'm going to assume your question means uh, how many incarcerated individuals in county jails would be uh, placed on the Medicaid. And that all depends on how many applications would be submitted. So um, the whole idea is recently the federal government provided some guidance that said that we um, could pay for inpatient hospital claims. So that kind of precipitated the work that we've done with the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Correction um, trying to pay for their inpatient claims. And then we extended that so then we could try to coordinate care for offenders that are being released back into the community to cut down on recidivism. So once we had the processes worked out for the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Correction, we started getting some contacts from different counties, commissioners, uh, sheriffs, jail staff, and they want us to extend this. So we had to kind of work out a way to do this. Um, as Sapphire told you, the processes we have with the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Correction are coordinated between that department and the Ohio Department of Medicaid. With the county jails, we're really encouraging the county job and family service departments and the county jails to meet and discuss a process to get these applications submitted and processed timely. Keep in mind that um, it would be very easy for um, uh, people in the sheriff's departments uh, in the jails to assist people to apply for Medicaid online or to call the uh, Ohio Medicaid consumer hotline to uh, get assistance in completing an application. That wouldn't be sufficient though. The volume of applications we get throughout Ohio are pretty high. So county job and family service departments are pretty busy. If you submit an application through a traditional route, either via the phone or a paper application that you mail into the county or online, chances are those will be in the regular queue with all the other applications. It could take 30 days to process that, and then we can't coordinate the care for an offender as they're released to the community. And if you're working or living in a metro county, the time frames for eligibility could be higher. So it's really important that uh, staff at either jails or uh, sheriff departments make contact with the JFS 
um, try to come up with a process, as Pickaway County did, where you can submit applications and have an assurance that they will be completed timely or in time for the consumer to be released. Um, the next question, will clients have active Medicaid when they enter jail? Um, maintain, or when, will clients who have active Medicaid when they enter jail maintain their Medicaid while in jail? Or will their Medicaid be terminated when they are incarcerated? Okay, and that's a good question. So uh, Sapphire did mention at one point the Rompier program. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that. So uh, I've, I've talked to numerous people in different types of um, occupations here about the Rompier system lately. Um, <clears throat> so the most recent question I had is, well, Ohio just went to a suspension state, right? And that's not actually the case. So the way Rompier works is if you're in the community on Medicaid and then you become incarcerated, up until we started these initiatives, meaning like up until about six months ago, then the county would have to go through a driver in our eligibility system and suspend the Medicaid. Now, suspending Medicaid works just like discontinuing or stopping Medicaid, that we no longer pay for claims. But the reason we did this was <clears throat> assuming the offender was released back in the, into the community within a year, then we wouldn't need a new application to reinstate that Medicaid. So the key point there is one year. If an offender had Medicaid, then was incarcerated, it all depended on how long it took them to be released back into the community. Less than a year, we could put them right back on without an application. And we keep them on for at least two months to give them time to um, get any other eligibility information to the counties. Now, with recent guidance from CMS that says that we can pay for inpatient stays for offenders, we didn't feel it was appropriate to go ahead and suspend the eligibility. So now if somebody is in the community on Medicaid and they are incarcerated, it's important that the county knows because in addition to doing Medicaid, the county also determines eligibility for TANF and SNAP or uh, the cash assistance and food assistance. Those programs, people cannot get those benefits while they are incarcerated. But you can now stay on Medicaid. So if somebody is in the community on Medicaid, if they become incarcerated, chances are they're going to stay on Medicaid. We need to know that they're uh, incarcerated so we can change their living arrangement. There are a lot of requirements for Medicaid, and one of them is, what is your living arrangement? Are you living in the community? Are you incarcerated? Are you in a long-term care facility? So we do need to know their incarceration status. But it's easier just not to touch the case, leave them on Medicaid, just change their living arrangement, then if you have an offender that does have an accident or an illness and needs to be uh, hospitalized and it does turn into an inpatient stay, then we can go ahead and pay that claim. And then we need to know when the offender is going to be released back to the community so that we can make sure that there are no issues with coverage, we get rid of that incarceration flag in the system, and it allows us to pay for any allowable medical claim. Um, this is a local jail-related question. If a person who already has Medicaid is set to jail for a few days during, this, during the month, is it still appropriate to bill Medicaid for their services if there is a secure transport to and from a community be behavioral health service? I don't believe we could pay for transportation, but that's one we want to do some research and get back. If that was a question about transportation as you read it. I, I think the question um, is, can they bill, so if they're transporting a client that's in, car, in jail for a few days to a behavioral health facility, can they bill for those behavioral health services even though they're in jail? So that I want to, I'll need the question in writing and we will do some research and get back to it. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and write down this question um, and then um, I have the person that um, submitted the question. I can email an answer to them and also post it on our um, Stepping Up web page along with the presentation. Um, the next question is, can community mental health centers meet the definition of FQHC lookalikes? 
That's a good question. Um, there is some CFR information on a an, what an FQHC lookalike is, and I'm going to have to go back and do some research. I'm not really certain. Okay, so we're going to do the same thing with that question as we um, did with the question before. Um, can we work with our jails to have offenders call the shared services phone number to apply for Medicaid? For Medicaid. That's a good question. So it's in the need. So let's say you're just screening every offender to see if they have Medicaid uh, because you're concerned about coordinating their health care needs upon release. That would be fine. But again, this is a routine way that anybody can apply for Medicaid, right? So if you would have an offender go through the shared services phone number and an application is submitted, chances are they can complete it right away. If not, it will fall into a queue with the regular population. If you're concerned that somebody needs some mental health services or addiction services upon their release and you need to coordinate it, by going through that route, you cannot guarantee that the application will be completed in time and eligibility will be there when the offender is released. It's better to make a contact with somebody at your local job and family services office. Again, like uh, with Pickaway County, they have one point of contact that deals with the offender population. This way, if you know that you have somebody who needs some uh, mental health services and they need them immediately upon release, you're not waiting for several weeks to get the application approved so you have that billing number with the offender. So it's better that you make contact, have some kind of way that you can submit an application right to the agency and they know it is for uh, the jail population. And it's good to know, keep in mind, when we talked about what they do at Pickaway County, so the county JFS gets information on the release date as well, so they can kind of coordinate the eligibility determination to sync up with that release date. Next question is, will we need to know how individuals who are in jail and are awaiting sentencing for 30 days or more are processed? Yeah, and I don't have the rule with me rough hand, I'm sorry. Um, our rule does talk about if somebody is, be, is being held um, uh, while they're awaiting their sentence. So we can get you that information and get it out to you as Julia said. An individual currently on Medicaid is arrested and incarcerated in a local for less than 30 days. To participate in Vivitrol protocol, they will need labs, assessments, and nurse visits to start the protocol. Will Medicaid cover these expenses? While somebody is incarcerated, we cannot cover those expenses unless they are admitted to a hospital as an inpatient for a reason associated with those tests. So if you have somebody that's incarcerated and they're going to be released and you're getting this blood work done and any tests done, any diagnostics, while they're incarcerated, we cannot pay for that. Um, and then it asks a follow-up question, what if they are incarcerated for 30 to 60 days? Yeah, so the time of incarceration does not matter. Again, up until the beginning of August, it kind of mattered because we had a romp ear system. So if somebody was released within 12 months, then we could reinstate them without an application. Otherwise, there are no time frames associated with the incarceration and Medicaid. So in our examples that you see in the presentation, you'll see that we talk about some short-term and long-term stays. The only reason being that um, typically we have process flows and a lot of information for the counties on how to process the case. With these individuals, people who are becoming incarcerated or coming out of incarceration, we needed the counties just to kind of think about it, assess the situation, find out why somebody needs Medicaid. Are we getting an application from an offender who's incarcerated in a county jail because they had an accident or an illness and they had to go to the hospital? If they're admitted to the hospital, then that's a claim that we can pay. So we tell people, go ahead and process the application, make sure you indicate that they're incarcerated, and that will, make sh that will allow our claims payment system to limit the payments just to those that are for inpatient hospitalization and the associated professional services. Now let's say you have somebody that the county is 
somebody at the county jail is talking to a consumer or an offender, you find out that they don't have Medic Medicaid, they don't have any medical coverage. And you know it's a mandate that people have to have medical coverage. So if you're submitting, a, if an application is submitted for that reason, that's fine. We can go ahead and process it. We want to process it and indicate that they're incarcerated so we can limit the claims payment. And that's important to let the county know when they're released so we can get rid of that flag that says incarceration, change it so that the, the eligibility is just for somebody living in the community, and then they have the full spectrum of uh, Medicaid services. So again, there are no time frames. We just tell the county, assess the situation. Do the people need medical coverage because they're incarcerated and being uh, admitted to a hospital? Or is it because the mental health agencies, uh, the sheriffs, or people at the jail are concerned that people will be released from jail without coverage? So it, it all depends. And that kind of drives how you process the application and when eligibility begins. Please explain what type of sub substance use disorder or behavioral health services Medicaid will cover during incarceration. Again, during incarceration, while somebody is physically locked up, no freedom of movement, Medicaid cannot pay for any kind of medical claims. How will DRC transitional control cases be handled for individuals who, are, who transition to a halfway house under TC status? status? Yeah, we are exploring our um, OAC and our OAC rules now. I can tell you the direction we're thinking is that um, there's been guidance by the federal government, and it pretty much has to do with freedom of movement. So if you're in a halfway house and you're released in the morning, and you can go out and make contacts in the community or go out to eat or seek employment or seek job training, then um, during that time you're not considered incarcerated. So that would imply that then you would be eligible for those services to be paid. But currently our OAC does not allow that. Would ODM ever consider allowing an employee within the sheriff's office to have access to Ohio benefits in order to process the applications internally? Yeah. And <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to need somebody to weigh in. So when you say to have somebody at the jail process the applications, um, so to get access to Ohio benefits, um, to, to the worker portal where you process applications, you pretty much have to be a, um, a county employee at this point. Um, it would be very difficult uh, to train uh, uh, jail staff on all the eligibility requirements to have them do it. Um, I, I do know of some counties that have staff from JFS that are outstationed in jails and then they work there to process applications. And, and then if you're, t and the reason I need some clarification because I could also take this to mean could you get up access to the system so you could submit applications for processing, but I'm not sure that's the best way to do this with an offender population when you're trying to make sure that care is coordinated upon their release. So if the person that asked the question is able to weigh in and further clarify, um, feel free to do so. And while we wait for that, I can tell you I, I received a question on Monday um, from a county and it was, hey, our jail would like to have access to MIPS. Um, and that's our claims payment system. So um, we could kind of check eligibility for individuals through that system. And um, I can tell you that you can go to the Medicaid um, website and there's a, uh, up across the Chevron up at the top, there's a tab that says for providers and it talks about requirements to become a Medicaid provider. Um, however, if uh, you have a jail that does not provide medical services themselves, they probably would not meet the requirements to be a Medicaid provider and we would not be able to get you access to the MITS uh, portal to check eligibility yourself. Uh, yet another reason I think it's important to have that uh, uh, contact or that relationship with somebody at the county JFS. Um, and in response to um, the clarification, um, they said, I was interested in the possibility of having a Medicaid specialist within the county jail who processes applications in all pre-release, 
but would be an employee of the sheriff's office. Yeah, so um, I, I don't believe that's possible right now, um, simply because without being uh, at the sheriff's office, I'm not sure I could even get you access to the uh, Ohio Benefits Eligibility System. But again, if you are in a metro county and you have a sizable jail population and you frequently or like throughout or on any given day, you do have a number of people who are being released. If you found that uh, most of your jail population does not have Medicaid coverage or any health coverage, then I would uh, uh, say maybe reach out to the JFS. Uh, again, there are several metros out there, two at least that I know of, that do have JFS staff who do go out to the jails and they are outstationed there. Um, it's not on a full-time basis. Um, and just like counties do this at um, some hospitals as well. So they take their JFS staff, actually place them in the jail to work with the offenders that would uh, need the application assistance. The next question is, do these changes apply to youth incarcerated in county detention centers rather than a state DYS facility? So with the, <clears throat> all right, so Sapphire kind of detailed how we take care of the DYS population that's coming out of custody or coming into custody and getting them on the Medicaid for any kind of inpatient hospitalization. If you have um, children that are working through county jails or DRC, uh, meaning they're being tried by uh, as an adult, I'm assuming, then we cannot use the presumptive eligibility model we use with DYS and the facility would have to um, submit applications however they decide to with the county as they would with a regular county jail or DRC population. Is a jail inmate on work release eligible for regular Medicaid or restricted coverage? And again, so if you have somebody who's incarcerated but they're on work release, so they, are, they do have some freedom of movement. Um, again, we are uh, exploring changes to our OAC um, to include that language. So in this situation, once our OAC changes, or if our uh, policy director puts out a Medicaid eligibility policy letter in the interim, then we could cover these people on full Medicaid and not just inpatient hospitalization. Our youth at community correction facilities, which are ran by DYS, also eligible under the DYS PE initiative? I, I, and that's a good question. So, and I think we need to go back and talk to our peers at DYS for that. So I'm not certain. I haven't heard anecdotally that they are working with these facilities, but I would have to go back and check. Okay, so, so I'll flag that question um, so that we know to get back to you. Um, much of your talk was around the inmate or around inmates with a projected release date. Approximately 60% to 70% of our inmates are released without a release date. My question is the 24-hour rule. If an inmate is not enrolled but has a hospital stay over 24 hours, does the hospital contact Medicaid to start the coverage process? How does that work? Yeah. So the hospital would not be responsible for contacting the JFS or Medicaid to get an application submitted or claims paid. So you can submit an application after the fact. So let me give you an example. You have somebody who's incarcerated, um, then there is an accident or an illness and they are taken into a hospital and subsequently admitted. So at this point, they may not have Medicaid. And I'm assuming that when they're admitted to the hospital, um, you're going to be talking to a, a billing specialist at the hospital because the hospital would know that you'd be on the hook if the person didn't have coverage, including Medicaid. Um, so, yeah, so. You have somebody who is admitted to the hospital. Let's say they're in there for 48 hours. Two days later, they come back to the facility and they're incarcerated again. At that point, you can go ahead and submit an application 
and uh, the county JFS can process it for eligibility. It's important, though, that you have that relationship with the county and you've met with them and you have processes because very, especially if uh, an, an inpatient stay in a hospital happens near the beginning or end of a month, you have to coordinate to make sure that there's coverage for the dates of service for the hospitalization. So, and um, the best way to do that is to have somebody at the county that you can contact and tell them, hey, we just sent an application for this offender. Um, let me give you some data examples. So you have somebody who is released, uh, or I'm sorry, incarcerated in November of 2016. And then on the, let's say, uh, what's today, the 30th? Let's say that they are admitted today. No, let's make it the 29th, yesterday, for, and for 24 hours, and then they're released back in the facility today. So they were incarcerated in November. So it's okay on December 1st or 2nd or 3rd or even the 30th to go ahead and apply for Medicaid to cover that hospitalization. It's important, though, that the county knows what the dates of service were because in this case where you have somebody admitted to a hospital one month and then you're applying the next month, they're going to have to backdate that eligibility to cover November. So it's just important that in addition to getting an application to the county for somebody who's admitted to a hospital, um, it's also imperative that they have the dates of service so we can make sure that the full hospitalization is covered. Our county provides AOD treatment for incarcerated persons. Will Medicaid pay for these services? In the past, a place of service 09 has always been rejected. If the person's incarcerated, again, if while somebody's incarcerated, um, we can only pay for the inpatient hospitalization. So in this case, no, we could not pay for it. But it's important that you seek Medicaid coverage for people that are not um, covered with any type of insurance, or even if they're going to be eligible and they do have other insurance sometimes. It's important to go ahead and get an application in just because I'm assuming if somebody's getting any kind of treatment while they're incarcerated, it will probably extend it once they were released. And at the point of release, then they would be eligible for medical claims payment. Um, and somebody asked, um, thank you for the information. Can you email an electronic version of the PowerPoint presentation? Um, as I previously noted, um, you can actually access the PowerPoint presentation currently um, by clicking on the hand, handouts portion of the screen. Um, additionally, the PowerPoint will also be on our webpage um, at maj.ohio.gov slash stepping up. Um, and I can also send out a response to everybody so you can um, have access to that website if you didn't catch writing it down. Um, next question is, any changes for youth in a detention facility or CCS? So, any changes? Uh, that one, I'm not certain what we're getting at. I can't even kind of drive what the question is. So, so whoever submitted that question, if it still hasn't been answered, um, as we've discussed youth um, in the previous questions, um, please submit a new question, and then we'll get to it as we go down. Um, I'm trying to think of, you know, if I don't understand a question, I'm trying to think of what you might be asking. So. I can tell you that just like with an adult um, offender who's incarcerated, um, pretty much the DYS rules follow the same thing. So um, if, if, you, if you had somebody who was in DY youth services uh, uh, under their control, uh, they have a process to get people covered for Medicaid. We still will only pay for inpatient hospitalization if somebody is under their control, and then we do have the the ability to do the presumptive so we can quickly cover them for when they go back um, under the control of their parents. So when we talk about any changes, kind of, I, I think it's safe to assume you can think of a youth pretty much just like you would an adult offender. If they are incarcerated, there is no eligibility for claims payment except for the inpatient hospitalization. But the reason we like this program is we're trying in addition to covering inpatient hospitalization, 
just making sure that when people are released from your facilities, then we can get them access to care immediately. And again, so anybody could be released from jail, or even while they're in jail, if they have access to either a phone or a computer, go ahead and apply on their own. But I can't urge you enough. The county JFSs are very busy, and they run three major programs. In addition to Medicaid, they do TANF and SNAP, and they get a lot of applications every day. And without some coordination with your local job and family services office, then you can't make sure that when the people are released from your custody, then they will have that insurance set up. It might take some time. For county jail time frames, is there a cutoff point between applying for the limited versus full benefits? If 30 days, it remains the same. For five months, it's limited. What about someone there for three months? What is the cutoff point? Right. There is no cutoff point. And there are no time frames, and it's hard to get used to this. Again, this is what you have to ask. If, why are you applying for a person to get Medicaid? So if the person's an offender and incarcerated, there's only two reasons why you should be applying for Medicaid. Either the person had an in injury or illness and they had to uh, be taken to a hospital and were subsequently admitted, or you're trying to make sure that when this person leaves the facility and they're free to go back to the community and live where they want to live and work where they want to work, then they have immediate access to medical care. So the reason we put time frames in there, you also have to understand that everybody who's on Medicaid gets what we call due process. So, and because of this, eligibility determinations are prospective. So let me explain this a little bit. So if I if I'm on Medicaid in the community and I become incarcerated, well, my caseworker would go into the system and indicate that I'm incarcerated. And when the caseworker does that, it changes my benefits that I'm able to get through Medicaid from a full Medicaid package down to this inpatient services hospitalization only. So we're kind of cutting somebody's benefits. And any time we're going to cut somebody's benefits, we have to give them due process or let them know we're going to cut their benefits and give them time to disagree with it or agree with it and let us know and call for a hearing if they want one. So a lot of times, any time that we make a determination, it doesn't take effect right away. So forget about the time frames. <clears throat> the whole idea is why are you applying for Medicaid? If it's because somebody's uh, taken to a hospital and admitted, it doesn't matter if they're incarcerated for one day or one year or ten years. you got to get the application into the county, make sure the county understands that the person is incarcerated but they were admitted as an inpatient, and it's imperative that they have those dates of service from when the person was admitted at the hospital. That way the county can make sure they process the case to include the dates of service. Now, if somebody is being uh, or applying for Medicaid because their release is imminent, then it's important that the county know when the person will probably be released so they can get the eligibility completed prior to that time, and then the person leaves the facility with Medicaid coverage and can get access to care. The reason we say short-term, long-term, two weeks, two months, five months, it just kind of helps you clarify the need. So, again, there are no time frames, none at all. You just have to ask yourself, and we told the counties this too, ask yourself the one question, why are you getting an application? Is, is the county just they noticed the person was uh, uninsured and wanted to make sure that for if and when they do get out and they, they do have coverage? Great. And we tell the county, process the application, indicate that they're incarcerated because we don't know if this is going to be a long-term stay or not. Now let's give you another one. So you have somebody who's going to be released in two weeks and you're applying to get coverage. So now this is when that due process comes into play. So if I were to go ahead and put somebody on Medicaid today, a brand new application, we're at the very end of November. We automatically take eligibility back to the beginning of the month. So this person would be fine. They're applying because they're going to be released at some point. The county processes the application. It goes back to the beginning of the month. And you can also request that uh, the eligibility go back three months prior to this month. We call that retroactive eligibility. But the problem is with this due process. So let's take the case where you have somebody who is 
on Medicaid in the community, then they're incarcerated and you have a county jail contacting the, the JFS and saying, hey, just to let you know, we've got Sean Lobs in here incarcerated. We saw he's on Medicaid. He's going to be getting out in a couple of weeks. <clears throat> it's just important to know that the caseworker has to go in and change the living arrangement and kind of indicate to the eligibility system where the person's staying. Are they incarcerated? Are they in their own home? Are they in a long-term care facility? And with the due process, anytime we make a change to a case that negatively impacts somebody or takes some of their benefits away, we can't make that um, change right away. So it usually lasts or happens either the next month or the month following the next month, depending on when you take the action. So we're at the end of November right now. So if I would try to make a change to somebody's case and take away some of their benefits, if I was notified today by a jail that somebody was incarcerated and this person already had Medicaid coverage in the community, so for me to change them to incarcerated in the system, once I process that through, in order to give somebody this due process time to call for a hearing if they don't agree, I can't really start this um, change until January 1st. So if you were to contact the county right now today and tell them that Sean Lotz, me, is getting released from jail, so you want, or, uh, wait, that would extend it. If, uh, if you're uh, telling the county today that I became incarcerated, I tried to change it in the system, it won't even take effect until January 1. So that's why we're telling counties, hey, if you have somebody who gets picked up because they're DUI and you know they're not going to be in there for a month, perhaps you don't even indicate incarceration on the case. You have to use your best judgment figure out why we're getting the application. And it's going to be one of two reasons. Because somebody was admitted to a hospital or because you're trying to coordinate their care for when they're released. At the beginning, you mentioned the policy change impacted individuals at ICF slash IIDs. How does this apply to them? So if you have somebody that is incarcerated, they're ended up taken to a, um, a nursing facility or an ICF IID or a hospital, and if they're admitted to one of those facilities, then they're no longer considered incarcerated. And they are eligible for claims payment. Anything for 12-day holding jails? Um, all right, so forgive me, I'm not really sure what a 12-day holding jail is, but I don't think it really applies. So if you have somebody in a 12-day holding jail and their freedom of movement is limited, then they're incarcerated. Um, Medicaid will not pay for any claims while they're incarcerated, except if they are admitted to a hospital or a nursing home or an ICF IED. In that case, then they're no longer considered incarcerated. We could pay for that inpatient stay. How does the community transition program relate? And does CareSource specifically provide additional services to released inmates? Yeah, and I want to apologize for that because we did not bring any of our managed care staff over here um, with us today. Um, let's see, does CareSource specifically provide additional services to released inmates? As part of our pre-release program with DRC, I can tell you that um, when we complete the application process, the offenders are asked to um, give us the name of the managed care plan they want to be enrolled in. Um, there, it's a pretty complex process, but all of the managed care plans even have video conferencing uh, equipment, as do the DRC facilities. They actually have video conferences with the offenders to find out what are their critical risk type indicators. Um, what types of severe and persistent mental illnesses they may have, what types of services they have. Um, they go down to like medications that people are on, and they do manage care. However, the same care management is pretty much available to everybody. Everybody has to be in managed care plan uh, enrollment for the most part, and we're going to an all managed care um, uh, design probably here. Um, shortly. So uh, the push is to get everybody into managed care and the managed care plans do coordinate the care. So 
So a little more so with these populations, we know that they are a little more critical and it's important that we manage their care. Um, but uh, care coordination is available to uh, most people on Medicaid. Just to be clear, if a person is currently incarcerated for less than 30 days, even though their Medicaid was not changed, Medicaid will not pay for their services while they, in they are incarcerated. Right. Now, so, so I've struggled with this and implementing, and, and implementing the system. And the problem is that the eligibility is so prospective. Um, and again, so if I try to indicate in our eligibility system today that somebody is incarcerated, what that kind of does, the end result, is it takes away some of their services, like doctor's visits and prescriptions and stuff like that. And anytime we do that, it's a delay because people, if they don't agree, can call for a hearing. So <clears throat> if you have a person that's going to be incarcerated for less than 30 days, so, and again, let's use today as an example. So you contact the county and say, yep, Sean Lotz just became incarcerated today. And the county tries to make that change in the system. The system will do it, but the system will not show me incarcerated and with the limited benefit plan until January 1st. But I'm incarcerated now, and it will probably be less than 30 days. So by the time I get out, and then you notify the county that I've gotten out and they process it back, the net effect in our eligibility and claims payment system is I was never incarcerated. So, and I'll tell you what, it causes leadership a, a considerable angst at our agency that we're going to be paying for a lot of claims for people that aren't inpatient type claims. But we get audited by the federal government and um, my fear is that if we have all kinds of instances or issues with paying for claims where it turns out people were incarcerated and we were not notified, um, I could see changes to the system or penalties. It is, is it important to check incoming inmates for Medicaid registration and get those who aren't currently enrolled in Medicaid enrolled, or should we focus just on the inmates leaving the jail? So that's a good question. Um, if as part of your screening when you accept uh, new incarcerated individuals you check on you know medical coverage then yeah in, indeed check on Medicaid as well um, there is a mandate with the ACA that people do have creditable coverage um, but I think it's more important as we know that there is a large population in jails that do have mental health or addiction uh, needs and so we see this more as coordinating the care upon release. But with that being said, um, if you have a large population that's incarcerated or because of the, your administrative setup, if this is something you want to screen at the beginning, it, again, there's no prohibition of applying for Medicaid when you're incarcerated. The prohibition is on what type of claims we can pay. So there's not a problem with screening people at the beginning. How will these changes affect community-based corrections facilities in local jails? Wow, that's a real broad question. So for me to tell you how it would affect local jails, we'd have to go back through the whole presentation. Um, let me try to put it uh, real short and sweet here. If you are incarcerated, we can only pay for claims that are from an inpatient hospitalization and associated professional claim. Um, and with community-based corrections, we are exploring rule changes for that. Um, but right now, it's if you're if you're in these facilities, you're incarcerated. We're looking at more of a freedom of movement um, model, where if you are released on a daily basis to go to work, job training, um, seek services, even medical services, then we would be able to pay them. Any updates on Medicaid expansion expiration in 2017? Uh, no, but I'm checking the newspaper every day just to see with the, uh, uh, after the election what may come. Will there be any coverage for incarcerated individuals who currently have Medicaid for prescriptions or doctor's visits during the incarceration? Does this change only affect inpatient care? Now, so if you have individuals that are currently incarcerated, 
and they do have Medicaid coverage, you need to let the counties know so they can make a change to the case if appropriate to indicate incarceration. But we can only pay for claims for inpatient hospitalization and the associated professional services. So we cannot pay for any kind of treatment while they are incarcerated except if they're admitted to the hospital and any of the claims associated with that admission. I am at a community-based correctional facility. Will the same processes apply at a county jail? I, they, the same processes would apply, and again, as soon as um, we make the changes to our policy, yes. The typical processing time for Medicaid applications can be up to 30 days. Not sure that, is, that it is reasonable to expect that applications can be submitted, processed, and approved in five to six days. Does this process assume no verification of information is needed prior to authorization? No, verification will still be needed prior to authorization. Now, and um, that actually the question's a little misleading because you say that eligibility can take up to 30 days. Um, I've been um, in Medicaid eligibility operations for about 15 years, and I can tell you it takes sometimes substantially longer than 30 days. That's why we are urging the counties and urging the jails and urging the sheriffs to meet and discuss this. If you try to submit an application through normal means, like going to benefits.ohio.gov or calling the shared services number or calling the Medicaid consumer hotline at 1-800-324-8680, any of those means, you're right. You're, the application for this offender will be in a normal queue. You have no control over how long it will take to process. We've trained the counties on this. And as we discussed in the presentation with Pickaway County, it would be in the consumer's best interest and your best interest to reach out to the JFS. Maybe they provide a point of contact. Maybe they have another solution. But if you know, it, with Pickaway County, applications are submitted directly to one person at the county. He gets information on release dates. So it is. Um, you can assume that he will get those covered in time to continue care for when the offender is released. But if, if I were to take an application and submit it to Franklin County without any indication that it was from a jail or from a sheriff, it might take a couple of months to get that eligibility going. But again, we've reached out to all the counties, including Franklin and Cuyahoga and the other metros, and said you need to work with these, you know, the jails and the sheriffs and come up with a way to coordinate the eligibility so it can be effective when somebody is released from jail. Do community-based correctional facilities fall under the DRC guidelines or jail guidelines? Um, so <clears throat> the I'm not certain. Whoever wrote this in can, um, so whoever wrote this question, I'm interested, are you working at a community-based correctional facility? Um, and Actually, the person that wrote it left. No. Yeah. So anything that falls under DRC, if somebody is, at, is at, in the custody of the state, the Department of Rehabilitation and Correction, none of this really applies. Um, Sapphire's unit processes applications and um, kind of maintains the eligibility for the rehabilitation and correction caseload. So we've met repeatedly, and when I say repeatedly, we're talking weekly since January of 2014, I believe, maybe even a couple months prior to that. We've been meeting with the DRC staff. So we have all the processes there. Um, if you're in a community community-based correctional facility that is under the guidance of or works with a county jail, and I don't even know, I don't work in DRC, so I don't even know if that's possible, but yeah, it's the county jails you need to work with. If these facilities are under the auspices of uh, the ODRC, 
then the Department of Medicaid manages the caseloads. So again, I um, had a, a, a meeting several weeks ago with our policy chief. We are looking, uh, due to the changes in the, the federal requirements, we're looking to make changes to our administrative code rules on these community-based correctional facilities. Right now, though, our OAC rules state that <clears throat> if you are incarcerated, that we can only pay for the, the claims for inpatient hospitalization and the associated professional claims. We're looking to get those policy changes made. Can you give the date this change started? Okay, so we started, um, we really don't have a date that it started. So we've talked about Ohio benefit, benefits. That's the eligibility system that we use for Medicaid here. Um, That system was implemented back in 2013 for the ACA and just because our old legacy system was about 35 years old. So we have our new Ohio benefits system. Um, once we brought that up with the uh, MAGI population, what we used to call covered families and children, these were, would be for people of low income or for children or for families, um, those Medicaid populations. Then we started taking a look at the DRC population and what we could do with the, um, the incarcerated individuals. Then recently we made the changes, and that was effective August 1st, we made the changes to the eligibility system and the claims payment system so we could introduce that limited benefit plan and limit the claims payment to just um, inpatient hospitalization. We held off on training the counties and the county commissioners and the county directors until August because we need to make those changes to the claims payment system and the eligibility system. So unofficially, I would say they started in August. Is this for every single person incarcerated or those offenders who have been previously on Medicaid or those close to release? No, nope, there's no prohibition on who applies for Medicaid or how many times you apply. So offenders can apply. And again, just to um, let an offender have access to a phone where they can call the hotline or shared services and apply probably wouldn't be beneficial because you cannot coordinate the start date of eligibility or when the application was processed. So whether somebody had eligibility in the community prior to incarceration or they're becoming incarcerated and you realize they have no eligibility, you can apply at any time. It's just important you reach out to the counties, have some kind of plan so when you do submit an application, they know it's from a local jail or a sheriff. They understand that the person is soon to be released and may have some mental health or addiction services um, that they need. So it's important to coordinate the start date and the eligibility. Online application at the jail would eliminate duplication of efforts in the data entry at the county JFS. Um, possibly. And, uh, oh, I see, uh, it looks like this is from a Medicaid uh, uh, employee. Um, online application at the jail would eliminate duplication of efforts and data entry at the JFS. Not necessarily. So um, anybody can apply, um, even at home, I could apply tonight for Medicaid. I wouldn't be eligible, but there's no prohibition that says I can't. Um, anybody can apply for Medicaid. Any, you can apply in numerous ways. You can apply online, you can apply through a paper application, you can request that from a county or through the hotline, you can call the hotline or you can call the shared services number. But th the thing is, simply providing an application, all that does is make sure you're going to get onto Medicaid. But if you're in a county jail in a metro county, you might not get on for a couple of months and you might have mental health or addiction needs like immediately upon your release. You can't coordinate that unless you have that dialogue with the county and have a way to submit these applications where they know they're from you and they know that the timing is critical to make sure that we can keep recidivism down by getting people the services that they need. If an individual is incarcerated short term, such as less than 30 days, in a county jail, will Medicaid reimburse for outpatient AOD services provided to that individual? 
if those services are provided outside of the jail. Medicaid cannot pay for any medical claims for people who are incarcerated except for inpatient hospitalization of at least 24 hours and then the associated professional claims. What is the process for those who are sentenced to prison for a year but eligible for an early release after 60 days? The individual is brought back to the county jail and granted the early release. Who is responsible for enrolling this individual? Well, so the individual is ultimately responsible for submitting an application. But if I was a working in a county jail or if I was the sheriff and I knew I had somebody in here, maybe they were put in jail because of some kind of addiction issue, and I was kind of concerned that they wouldn't get services upon their release, because they didn't have any eligibility, then I'd want to help that person apply for Medicaid. And again, a person can apply on their own. There are numerous ways to do so. But then you lose that control of coordinating the eligibility determination with the release date. And that can be critical. So again, if, I'm, if I become incarcerated in Franklin County and I tell the jail, oh, that's OK, I'm going to go home today anyways, I'll just apply at home, that's great and it might be two months before a county can process your application. If you're assisting somebody to apply and they're going to be released in a couple of weeks instead of a year, is it your obligation? No. But again, you have the ability to contact the county, set up a meeting, try to come up with a process where you can submit applications for offenders, letting the county know why, whether it's inpatient hospitalization or you just want to make sure that we can coordinate the care upon their release. And this way the county will work with you and they can assure that the application is processed in a timely manner. If an inmate is admitted to the hospital and he is placed on a furlough, since he is no longer incarcerated, how long does this affect his insurance coverage? When we place people on Medicaid, Typically, the eligibility lasts for a year. Now, that's assuming there are no changes to a case and a consumer or an individual has the responsibility to notify the JFS of any changes to their case. So with that being said, so sometimes you could get somebody that's incarcerated, JFS will already know. Maybe somebody in the house already, already told them. So, um, but again, if we place somebody on eligibility for Medicaid, it's probably for a year unless their, their circumstances change. So even if we process an application because somebody is admitted to the hospital, we're going to process that application. And if we make it, if we process it today at the end of November, the eligibility goes back to the beginning of November automatically and should be in effect through next October. Coverage does not include a 24-hour observation, correct? What admission code would need to be used by the hospital? Um, that's one we're going to have to get back with you. I don't understand admission codes. I work in eligibility as the Sapphire, so I apologize. Um, did Pickaway County provide a flow sheet of how they effectively coordinate with their local sheriff's office? So they didn't really provide a flow sheet, but um, how about if we have Sapphire kind of go through their process because it's a pretty simple process. The key being that the sheriffs and the jail met with the JFS and they came up with this very easy process. So the slide deck, it was referring to a question, what are your best practices? And um, the uh, manager stated that the sheriff's office sends him a roster once a week with the inmates that will be eligible for release. Then he travels to the sheriff's office, has them complete a paper application. Once the application is completed, he goes back to the agency and processes the application. Then once he gets them approved, he emails the contact worker at the sheriff's office with the billing number for the individual. So it seemed like it was like too short a process really to flow it out. 
When the offender is released back to a family who is already receiving assistance or, do not or does not qualify, are these family members included on the case, which could then affect eligibility? Yeah, so it all depends. There are different circumstances. You could have an individual that is in the community on Medicaid with a family, becomes incarcerated. Then we can indicate that the person is incarcerated, change their living arrangement, and go ahead and process the case again. When they're released, we would just change that living arrangement back to in the community and then have them rejoin the family's case. The eligibility of an individual, or I'm sorry, um, yes, income and other circumstances of an individual can affect the eligibility of the rest of the family. However, most of the individuals that we're placing on Medicaid because they're incarcerated are not age-blind or disabled, and our policy around those programs just changed, but it's because they are either part of the extension population, meaning they're single adults without dependents, um, uninsured, and up to age 65, so we can put them on our Medicaid extension, or maybe their parents are caretakers or former foster children, so uh, some of the MAGI groups. With the MAGI groups, it's important to know that you don't have to be, we define a household a very specific way. And it doesn't mean who's living under a roof. Um, it has more to do with um, how taxes are filed and who, uh, who you claim when you're filing taxes. But yes, we do have to consider the family, even with, while they're in jail, we do have to consider the family circumstances. And it's important to let the counties know if you are a jail or a sheriff out there, um, if you have people that are in our system and they do become incarcerated, again, um, incarceration also affects food stamps or SNAP and Ohio Works First or TANF, however you refer to those programs. Is it possible that the county process could support not only application and approval for Medicaid pre-releases, but also election of a managed care company like the ODRC pre-release program? Um, I don't have anybody managed care here, um, but and currently, you are um, <clears throat> enrolled into Medicaid, and then we send out information and you select a plan. I know there are changes that we are considering for managed care enrollment at Medicaid, um, but at this time, I, I don't believe we'd be able to really do that. However, um, the, the Ohio uh, Medicaid Consumer Hotline, and I'll give you that number again, it's 1-800. 324-8680 is also the managed care enrollment um, contractor. So calling that hotline, they can assist with the <coughs> uh, managed care selection. The only Medicaid service that can be covered while they are in jail is an inpatient stay. Correct. Are youth on Medicaid able to continue to, use, continue to use their Medicaid while they are incarcerated in a locked facility? No. If, if somebody is incarcerated, again, so, uh, yeah. If somebody is incarcerated, we're going to pay for inpatient hospitalization only. There are no other services that we will pay for incarcerated individuals. For inmates with limited benefits while incarcerated for whom the benefits would cover inpatient stays, would the emergency room visit preceding the inpatient stay also be covered? That's a good question and that's one where I have to take back to our policy people. I'm not really certain. Are services provided by a Community Alternative Sentencing Center eligible for Medicaid? And I don't know enough about that really to be able to answer it right now. We'd have to go back and do some research on it. I'll flag that question as well. What is the shared services phone number? We will have the shared services number in the Q&A um, that we post afterwards. Who gets notified of lease date? 
That's a good question. So that's who, okay, so you're asking who gets notified of the release date. So earlier in the presentation, we said it's a good idea to reach out and make contact with the JFS. So it really, you don't know until you reach out and make contact with your county JFS. So again, in Pickaway County, they have one administrator who's coordinating all this. If you're in Pickaway County, he would need the release date. If you're in another county, I can't tell you that until you have that conversation with the county. So that's why it's imperative that you reach out to the county JFS. If you're a jail or a sheriff or you know drug courts or any of these people that work with offenders and try to sit down as a group and come up with a process. If an offender is released from the local jail earlier than their original release date, can their application be expedited? Or what needs to happen to get their application approved? And that's the process you have to work out with the local county Department of Job and Family Services. And again, so the process right now, anybody can apply for Medicaid at any time. And once an application is submitted, the county will process it. I can tell you that the county's processed a lot of applications. We're telling you that it's really important that you meet with people at JFS and try to come up with a process where you can let them know that, hey, an application was submitted. Here's the individual's name or social security number. And they're about to be released and they have some mental health issues that we are concerned about. This way the county knows to process the case. Maybe pull that case and process it more timely. Again, the counties are very busy. They get a lot of applications for a lot of different programs. Sometimes we'll take an inmate to the hospital where the hospital will hold them for more than 24 hours for observation, but not admit the inmate. Are these situations allowed to be billed, for, billed to Medicaid? Medicaid will pay for incarcerated individuals when they are admitted as an inpatient for more than 24 hours, and we can also pay for the associated medical claims. Working in the Montgomery County Jail as a case manager, all inmates are not sentenced for a long period of time. So when would be the best time to have them do an application? For instance, someone is only here for two weeks, when would you process the application? Now that's a great question. So when would you process the application? And again, you have to go back to that one question that's so very important to ask about an application from a person who's incarcerated. Why are you getting the application? All right. So I can think of two reasons why you're getting an application from somebody who's incarcerated. One, their release is imminent. And you know that they're going to need some medical services upon their release. So I'd say it's imperative that you process that application prior to their release date. Or you can get an application because somebody was admitted to a hospital as an inpatient for more than 24 hours. In which case, it doesn't matter when you submit, or submit the application, technically, it's imperative that you put the dates of service when they were admitted on the application. Now, there's no place for that on an application. Another reason to meet with your county JFS people, and they might say, hey, use paper application. You can fax it to us, and you can write the dates of service right across the top. Maybe they say, hey, send us a spreadsheet of all the people being released with the release dates, and then we'll look for the applications as they're submitted electronically. It's just, it's, it's key as a worker that you ask yourself that one question, why am I getting the application? If it's because they're going to be released, you want to coordinate that eligibility determination so it's completed prior to their release date. If it's for an inpatient hospitalization, then you need to make sure the application is submitted within three months of that hospitalization, and it's important that the county knows the date of the inpatient stay. Earlier, you stated that transportation is typically not covered. If an individual is transported via EMS to a hospital and it turns into an inpatient stay, will that transportation cost be covered? I don't believe so, but I will have to check. So I'll flag that question and we can post it. What about offenders to electronic monitoring? Those individuals would be treated just like anybody out in the community. So they would be eligible for um, that full benefit plan. Does Medicaid require pre-certification for services when an inmate is admitted or hospitalized for over 24 hours? And I apologize for that one. It's not an eligibility question, so we can take it back and get a response. I don't believe so, but yeah.
when will an offender be required to select a managed care provider? Um, so, again, I expect some changes in the managed care area at some point here uh, with Medicaid, but currently, once you're enrolled in Medicaid, um, a short time after that, you receive some information about uh, selecting a managed care plan. So it's, I'd say, within a month. Can you explain in a little more detail how the halfway house will be affected by the Medicaid changes? Will they be eligible for Medicaid while they're, they are in the program? And again, we're exploring changes to our policy, and uh, once we have those done, we'll be training counties and I'll have more information at that time. Will there be a plan to mirror a pre-release plan for jail similar to the current DRC pre-release prison program that includes collaboration with the selected managed care plan for coordination of care purposes? Um, <clears throat> Not that I'm aware of. An inmate is unable to post bond, has been admitted to the hospital, and has been there past 24 hours. Does the coverage for billing actually pay for everything since arrival at the hospital or only the services after 24 hours had passed? Yeah, and that's uh, just like the question we had before. That's for our policy people, and uh, we're going to have to take that back. Managed care plans such as CareSource are refusing to pay for incarcerated inmate care when hospitalized outside the jail unless the jailed inmate has been in jail less than 15 days. How can jails get CareSource or other HMOs on the same page with the Medicaid rules for payment of hospitalized inmates. And we'll take that back to our managed care peers at Medicaid. So uh, we got one question here from a county. Go ahead, Julie, you can read that one. Um, actually, paper applications received start right from the right from the jail might be preferable since there is a high probability that applications filed online for individuals already known to the OWBP system will fall out and not be found right away by the county of residence. Yeah, and Paul, you're absolutely right. And um, this is why we've urged, every time we've talked to the counties about this, we've urged like, hey, meet with, you heard Sapphire talking about what they do in Pickaway, they do use paper application. It might be preferable in your county. Um, other counties, I, I'm not going to say what's going to be prefer preferable in each of the 88 counties, but um, some people might like an electronic application and just a spreadsheet of the offenders that they're getting applications for so they can go look them up. Um, but I, I do see the system issues that you're talking about. But again, it's, um, I, I think it's important that the JFSs meet with the jails and sheriffs, even maybe invite the, any kind of mental health community agencies that you have there in your uh, communities. Sit down and talk about this why the need for an application, how best to submit it, how best to get the application back to the interested parties on eligibility. If you change a living situation from incarcerated to living in the community on a person's Medicaid status, how long before that change takes effect? So to go from incarcerated to living, or to living in the community is a little different. So that's actually a positive for the offender, right? So we had them listed as incarcerated, so that means that we're only paid for the inpatient hospitalization and the associated professional claims. If we make a switch in the eligibility system saying they're back in the community, that means that we can give them the full Medicaid benefit. So that's not like an adverse action or an action for which somebody needs a due process. I couldn't imagine anyone trying to call for a hearing and saying, hey, you want to give us too many services. So if that's the case, it happens pretty much immediately. If the need for MAT is critical, can a released offender go to the first agency with an open appointment? So when we say a released offender, so is this somebody who's incarcerated or not? I'm not certain. So if they're incarcerated, we can't pay for this. If, if you're looking at somebody who's on Medicaid, they're released from the jail, 
So if that's what you mean by released offender, they're no longer incarcerated. Yeah, I, I guess I need more information there. I don't understand the question. Unless you can clarify, I don't. I, I it sounds to me like they're saying if they're released from they're, a released offender would be somebody that's not incarcerated, so that it would just be just like anybody else in the community. Then, as long as yeah. the Medicaid was coordinated, so the eligibility happened before their release from jail. Now they've got a full Medicaid card. Providers can contact the IVR or look at MITS and find out eligibility. They would show in the system and they'd be eligible for service. Um, and it looks like the rest of the questions are just about the um, PowerPoint slides and handout information. Um, like I said, that'll be posted on the web page. I'm going to respond to somebody's question once we wrap up here so that you all have the website and have my email address if there's further questions. Um, and then somebody else asked if um, I would be emailing any type of certificate to prove attendance at the webinar. Um, I will not, but I can, um, I'll provide, like I said, I'll provide my email at the end of this. And it's also on the um, webinar information. My email address is there. Um, and you can contact me if you need some type of proof. And I can send an email confirming that you did, in fact, attend. And it looks like that's all the questions. So thank you, everybody, um, for attending the webinar. And thank you for, to the Department of Medicaid for um, offering this great presentation and um, answering the many questions that everybody had.